Don't you just love this worship team we have? Amen. They are the best. Amen. We are so blessed to enjoy how they bring us into the presence of the Lord every single week, and they do a fantastic job. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> All right. Turn with me, if you would, to uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2. I, uh, I love this series on the Holy Spirit because I know and I have learned in my life that I need Him every day. I need the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit. And I think that over the years, I've noticed that there's a lot of misunderstandings about the Holy Spirit. And I think that there are some, some Christians who take things to a, an extreme one way or the other in their belief system about what the Holy Spirit does and who He is. And I've seen it where some people will, will go so far in one direction, it's like, man, that's, that's really not the Holy Spirit. And then other people will go in, a, in another direction and basically try to say the Holy Spirit, you know, doesn't work in our day. He worked in the days, you know, in the past. And today he's, you know, I don't know, he's on vacation or something. And... Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> and I want to I want to talk about this subject today, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, His illuminating work. And you think, well, that's just a a word I don't use on a regular basis, and that's probably true. You probably don't go, you know, in your normal conversation this past week, you probably did not use the word illuminate. Okay. Uh, but it is, it is something that is really a very core part of what the Holy Spirit does, whether you even think about it or not. But this is really important. I, I want you to, before we get off, I don't want you to start thinking when we think of, a, of illuminating work of the Spirit. It's like, you know, that uh, he's going to, you know, somehow or another show us the Twilight Zone or something, you know. That, that there's some people that have uh, bizarre understandings of this, and so I want to kind of clarify this, but show you how very practical and necessary the illuminating work of the Spirit is in your daily, weekly, regular life, okay? When you become a Christian, God gives you a new capacity to communicate and to fellowship with Him. We've been talking about this uh, several times as we started into this series. He has transformed the inner you. He has made your dead spirit come alive. And we, we understand body, soul, spirit, spirit, soul, body. We understand that the soul and the body are active in all human beings, but the spirit is dead in a person who is not a Christian. It is when you come to Christ and you respond to the Holy Spirit speaking to your spirit and say, yes, God, I want you, I need you, I surrender my life to you. At that moment, you become born again, regenerated by the Spirit. You become transformed by the Spirit. Your spirit, which was once dead, is now come alive. And you are made alive in Christ. And the Holy Spirit then is activated that part of you, that portion of you that's been dead, all right? And so we understand that. I've been talking about that several times. But now, because of that, he now gives you and me the ministry of illumination. What does illumination mean? It means enlightenment. Some of you say, that doesn't help me much. That's the same kind of word to me, all right? It means the Spirit enables you to grasp experience, and apply God's truth in your life. An unbeliever has a darkened mind and does not have the capacity 
to understand spiritual truth. That is because if you are not a born-again Christian, you are limited to your five natural senses. And the spiritual sense that you should have is dead and inactive and incapable of understanding spiritual truth. The Spirit serves as the light of our lives. I almost titled this message, You Light Up My Life, but I, I just I cited against it. All right. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2. We, we, we used this scripture last week to talk a little bit, but I want to expand a little more. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Now you stop right there. You see what we're talking about? Those are the senses, if you will, some of the senses that every human being has. All right? But we cannot understand, we cannot conceive, we cannot see, we cannot receive the things of God through those senses. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. All right. Let me talk a little bit about what or how the Spirit illumines us, okay? That word illumine is enlightenment or simply turn on the light, shine a light on, okay, gives us understanding. So, so we don't need to, to use a word that seems confusing. But I want you to see what he does. First of all, number one, he gives us spiritual discernment. This is the ability to distinguish good from evil and right from wrong and to make sense out of what is happening. You ever wonder why people who do not know Christ seem unable to recognize things that seem obvious to a believer? You can look at the circumstances that are happening in our world and specifically the moral decay that's happening in the United States, and if, if it doesn't grieve you, you're not paying attention. If it doesn't grieve you, I question whether or not you have the Spirit of God in you. Because if you don't see the moral decay that's happening, then you're like the world who looks around and says, this, everything's great. Everything's wonderful. And people that do not have the Spirit of God to communicate with them, who are not understanding things on a spiritual level, will look at things around them with different eyes than you and I can look at them. And so it is important to understand that, that the first thing He does for us, one of the key things the Holy Spirit does for us, is He gives us spiritual discernment. Isaiah 55 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You see, God's understanding, spiritual understanding, is higher and far above human understanding. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. I think that verse says it pretty clearly. That the, uh, that the, the understanding of an unsaved, unregenerate person cannot grasp spiritual truth. When you are trying to tell somebody who is not saved a spiritual truth, a spiritual dynamic, they will look at you like deer in the headlights. And they will say, I don't get that. Years ago when I was pastoring in uh, Scotts Valley, which is just outside of Santa Cruz, California, um, I got a call from a, stu a, a student 
from uh, UC uh, Santa Cruz, University of California at Santa Cruz, and said that she was doing a project and she had to write a paper and she wanted to, it, it had to do with uh, uh, abortion issues and, and other kinds of social issues that, uh, that, that, that were of interest to the church. And she said, I, part of my research is I need to interview a pastor. She said, can I, can I come in and, and talk to you? And I said, yes, of course, come on in. And so she came in the office and, and we had a really nice conversation. But uh, I'll let you know, she wasn't a Christian like about 99% of the students at UC Santa Cruz. And, uh, and, and we, we, we got on to conversations about a number of social issues. And, and I'm telling you, she looked at me like a deer in the headlights. And she couldn't grasp anything. It was like, pssst. She's like, I don't, I don't see that. Even though I would lay things out logically and clearly to her on all these issues, she could not receive them and she could not accept them. It's because her mind and her spirit was not activated to receive spiritual truth. And so even though, even though I thought it was logical truth, it was clear to, to I thought a logical mind as well as a spiritual mind, it just went right past her. And so she took, uh, she took her notes back and probably didn't do a very good paper. Uh, at least not one that, that gave our side uh, the proper, uh, proper points. And so we need to see that the things of God are only spiritually discerned. So the first thing, and really almost the only thing in some ways, we need to do with people who are not Christian and not people of faith is bring them to Christ. Because they're not going to understand things until they fully grasp the Lord, until the, until the Holy Spirit can begin to speak into their hearts. Romans eleven thirty three, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable His judgments and His paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been His counselor? You see, the things of God are, are way above human understanding. That's why God is speaking a language that we can't interpret. All right? He is speaking a language that we can't interpret. And so we need a translator in order to understand the things of God. And the Holy Spirit is our translator. Now, I have been blessed to, uh, to be able to travel the world and be able to also to be able to minister in a number of different countries. And uh, I, uh, uh, I remember being, you know, the first time I ever went out of the country, I did, I did some ministry in Romania, one year after communism fell. And trying to be able to communicate to Romanian pastors. Now we're talking about these guys have been an underground church because it was illegal for them to have a church for many years under communism. And so now they've been, but they've been trying to pastor churches without any bit of training in their lives at all. I mean, we're talking about the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker trying to be pastors. <laughs> and so five of us went to Romania and held a two week long pastor's school in which we taught them a lot of the basics of just what you need to understand in order to be a pastor. And so, of course, they didn't speak English, so we had to work through interpreters, which was a challenge at best. And then I remember going to uh, Brazil, and of course, in Brazil, they speak Portuguese. And very few of the people, unless they're in the, in the areas of the tourist areas, very few of the people outside of there speak any English at all. So I had to work with my friend Terry as an interpreter and did and I, and I spoke 15 times in the times I was in Brazil. And so all, I had to work with an interpreter. And then I, I've been in Sri Lanka. And, and in Sri Lanka, you have to understand, especially during the time I was there, there was a, a very uh, strong civil war because there's two very, very distinct ethnic groups in the country of Sri Lanka, and they're called the Tamil and the Singhalese. And the Tamil and the Singhalese each speak their own language, and it's important that they maintain their language, and so they don't... They don't try to learn English, and they don't try to learn the other person's language. And so uh, we were working, uh, Kim and I both, actually Kim went with me on this trip, and she spoke to the women, and I spoke to the men, and we both had to work not just with one translator, but with two. Because we had, uh, amongst the church leaders that we were uh, traveling around the country to speak with, the different leaders were, in, in each setting, we had Tamil and Singhalese leaders. And so... 
And so we would, I, would, I would have to get up and I would speak and I would share a sentence or two and then I would wait while all of you Tamils got to hear the Tamil interpretation and then after the Tamil, then the Singhalese would have to interpret over here on this side for all the Singhalese. And so then, and then, I, would, then I would say another sentence or two and then the Tamil would interpret. And so you can see what, it was crazy. Okay? <laughs> trying, to, trying to communicate. And I remember trying to say something, and, and I used a turn of phrase that was apparently unfamiliar to my interpreters. I don't know, I said something like sleeping like a log or something, I don't know, I, whatever I said <laughs> was something that the interpreter stopped and I waited. He didn't say anything. He turned around and looked at me and goes, huh? <laughs> and I looked over at the other interpreter and he goes, huh? So I said it again, and I tried to make it a little more clear, a little more simpler, and then he goes, huh? <laughs> and then, so then I, then I took away the, the, the turn of phrase completely and just tried to say it very simply and very easily so he could get it all. And so then they both interpreted it, but apparently they interpreted it wrong, and everybody started laughing. <laughs> like you would have if I'd have fell right there. And everybody started laughing, and I'm like, it wasn't a funny point. Why were they laughing? And I, you know, and I later had to find out from the missionary what the guy had actually said, and it was, it was pretty funny. <laughs> and, uh, the thing is, and by the way, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to pray for me, uh, me and, and Robert de la Batoria, who's uh, a brother. He and Kelly have been coming here for uh, uh, a few months now. And uh, Robert is very active in the Navigator Ministry, Navigator Program. He has discipled many. He has been working for about eight years now, discipling pastors and helping pastors disciple their churches in the Philippines. And so he is taking a trip, and he has asked me to join him. And so, because he knows my heart is, is very strong on wanting to see discipleship become a, a core of, of our church. And by the way, we have several very wonderful discipleship groups that are, ha that are happening already in the church. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to ask the leaders to stand. Gary, I see you. I don't see Trudy anywhere, but here's Gary. And then there's Josephine. And then Kim is leading a group. And, and Mike. And then uh, I know Wayne Muniz is leading a men's group. Oh, but Robert. Robert is here. You are, there's Robert. Stand up in the back. This is Robert De La Batoria. And uh, great brother. He's a crazy Hawaiian. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so uh, but he's a, he's a he's a tremendous brother, and uh, and so I'm going with him. We are leaving one week from tomorrow to spend 12 days in the Philippines, and I would ask you for your prayers because uh, we'll be working with an interpreter there, I think, too, a little bit. And so, uh, but but these these folks, and I know uh, who's the who's the other group? Don't we have another discipleship group? Wayne. Oh, Chuck. Chuck has a group. Where's Chuck? He's not here. Chuck has a, has a men's group that's meeting as well. And uh, God bless you guys. You can be seated. But there's, here's a group. We want to form a whole lot more because my prayer is that everybody in our church will be involved in, in being discipled and discipling others. And I think that you'll find that it's going to make a huge difference in your life. But we are, we are leaving for the Philippines a week from tomorrow, and I would ask for your prayers as, uh, as we go to work with some pastors and, and leaders there and, uh, and see what God is going to do. And, uh, and so it's, it's amazing how the, the gospel and the power of the word is true, but it, it, when you're going to a different country or to a, a land where people speak a different language, even within this country, uh, you need an interpreter. Well, the Holy Spirit is a much better interpreter than the ones I had in Sri Lanka, all right? Because he knows exactly what God the Father wants to say to you, and he will speak it right to your spirit exactly the way you need to hear it. And that's what his discernment has a lot to do with, is that he will help us know and understand God's will and God's truth. Second Kings 6, we uh, heard this story. Elisha's servant was frantic when uh, he saw the Aramean army uh, all gathering around, and he was fearful, and he went to Elisha, and he said, Master, he said, what do we do? And, and Elisha was calm and steadfast, and, 
And so then he said, Lord, op open his eyes. And so when the servant's eyes was opened, he saw the armies of the Lord, which were vast and far greater than the armies of the Aramean nation. And he suddenly realized that what he had not seen was what he needed to see. So the illuminating work of the Spirit will help you see what God wants you to see. He will help you to understand. The Proverbs 20, verse 27 says, The spirit of the man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the innermost parts of his being. So you don't need horoscopes, Ouija boards, palm readers, or even non-Christian counselors and therapists to tell you about your tomorrow. You just need the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you on the level that you need to understand. And that's the, his discernment. All right, number two is he gives us the power of recall. Now, in John 14, 26, Jesus said this, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Have you ever, ever asked the question, how did we get the Bible? You know, where, where did the Bible come from? How do we know that, this, that, that what we have here is, is trustworthy? Okay, well, first of all, we know that in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is inspired of God, or it's God-breathed. And so we know that it was not humans that simply wrote down their opinions. It was God that, that supernaturally spoke it to them. In 2 Peter 1, it says this in verse 20, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along or moved by the Holy Spirit. And so we know that Scripture itself came because God spoke it. You ever wonder when you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or, or some of these stories, you wonder, how did they remember all of that? How do they remember every detail? I mean, some of us try to, re try to remember one scripture verse, and it's like, okay, a week later, oh, wow, what was that? You know, and so, uh, and, 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 you know, I mean, uh, Terry, you're not the only one that has these memory problems, okay? We, we get to that point where we start, you know, what was I going to do? What was I going to say? Okay, and it, it happens to us all. So how in the world could these guys remember all of the specific details about what happened when Christ was walking the earth. Well, Jesus gave him the promise. He said that the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I have said. He will give you all these truths. How, did, how, did we, how do we know what happened in Genesis? How do we know about Adam and Eve and all those things? You know that the, that the, the book of Genesis was written by Moses. And Moses, we know, had a lot of face-to-face -face encounters with God. Let me tell you something. I'll trust him. And if God spoke to him and said, this is what happened, I'm going to believe that that's what happened because God revealed it to him. And so we, we know the Bible came from God himself and it is trustworthy. And if you try to, uh, to go through it and scrutinize it, you'll understand that the Bible being the most scrutinized and criticized book of all time has stood the test. And more and more, as science keeps under, undercovering different uh, archaeology and different other stories that and for many years were considered to be uh, false in the Bible, they're becoming justified over and over again as God begins to reveal that the truths of Scripture are actually truth. Amen. And so you'll find that in many places in the Bible, there was science that was actually known by God that they didn't know about at the time when the Bible was written and so you'll find that later on, some of the things that you read about in Scripture were actually scientific discoveries that we didn't find out by scientists until maybe the 20th century. And so we find that Scripture is reliable. We got it from God because He spoke it by the Holy Spirit. So then the question is, why do we study the Bible? Well, it's because it gives the Holy Spirit something to bring up to your remembrance. He said that he will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Well, he can't remind you of something you haven't heard in the first place, right? Have you ever, you ever uh, students, have you ever gone to take a test? Or maybe you as a, 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 you know, you've gone to take your driver's test if you're an adult or you've gone to take a, another kind of exam, okay? Have you ever prayed, oh God, help me remember? <laughs> oh God, help me do well on this test. Let me tell you something. Have you ever, ever prayed this prayer? Lord, help me remember everything I've studied. Okay, 
that prayer is useless if you haven't studied. <laughs> There's some people that's like, Lord, I didn't read a thing, but I want you to put it all in my mind. Okay? Lord, just, just drop it right in there right now. You know, I don't have time to read the books. Okay? Let me tell you something. You need to put the Word of God in you so the Holy Spirit has something to bring back to your remembrance. And so the same way if you're a student, you've got to read the books. You've got to do the studying. <coughs> you've got to do the work if you want the Holy Spirit to be able to re re help you remember things and bring them back. And so that's why we study the Word. That's why we're in the Scriptures on a daily basis. Because what you're doing is you're inputting things into your spirit, into your heart, into your mind, so that when the time is needed, they'll come back to you. Because the Spirit of God will say, that thing you read a year ago, that thing you read a month ago, that, that scripture you read two days ago, right now is when you're going to need it the most. And the Holy Spirit can bring it back. And so that's why we need to be constantly putting the Word of God into our system so the Holy Spirit has something to work with. Matthew 10, 19. It prepares us uh, for ministry and, and persecution as well. It says, when they deliver you up, you do not become anxious about anything or about how you or what you will speak, for it will be given you in the hour what you are to speak. So when, the, when you are about to go through persecution, let me tell you something, you have the word. You remember when Jesus went out into the, to the wilderness to be tempted by the, by the devil? And every time the devil came against him, how did he beat him? He said, it is written. You shall do this. It is written. You should do that. And so the Spirit of God even spoke to the Son of God and reminded him of the Word of God, and that's what gave him the power to have victory. The third thing that illumination does in your life is it brings spiritual confidence. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So what this means is that the Holy Spirit changes the way you see things and feel about things. In uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, and I'm not going to go to it, but you can go read the story if you don't know it. In Acts chapter 20, it's getting toward the end of the book of Acts. It's getting toward the end of Paul the Apostle's ministry. And he, is, he, has been, he was there in Ephesus, in, and he had started a uh, you know, great church. He had gone there. He had written them letters. He had been there. And so he knew that his time was coming to an end. And so he went to these leaders and he gathered them together and he said, I will never see you again. This is my last time to be with you. And of course, they were, they were discouraged and they were weeping on his shoulder. And then there was a prophet who came to him and said, don't go to Jerusalem because this is what's going to happen. You're going to be bound. You're going to be imprisoned. These things are going to happen to you. And Paul said, God's already showed me that. I already know that those things lie ahead. I already know that suffering and persecution and prison are in my future. But what did he say? I'm going to go hide now? No, he said, but I'm going anyway. Because this is the will of God. God's will for me is that I go forward because this is going to be for his glory. And so sometimes... We need to understand that God will reveal things to you that are not all that encouraging. You remember when Ananias went to, 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 to see Paul? And, uh, and, and, and uh, Paul had been blinded on the road to Damascus. And, and he was there, and he was blind, and he was waiting for God. And, and God told Ananias to go see him, and he's like, Lord, you know he's a murderer, right? You, you know he, he doesn't like Christians, right? You know, he's probably going to, you know, kill me. He says, no, he says, you're going to go lay hands on him and he's going to be healed. And then I want you to do this. I want you to tell him all the things he's going to suffer for me in my name. How would, how would you like to deliver that message? Okay? You get to go tell somebody they're going to suffer and go through great trials, not just once, not just twice, but the rest of their life they are going to live a life of suffering for God. Man, that's not really part of the feel-good gospel, is it? <laughs> and yet that's what Ananias' job was, was to go tell Paul that. And here Paul was told by Agabus the prophet that this is going to happen to him, and yet he said, I know a rough time is coming, but I'm going because it's God's will. Remember Stephen? Stephen was, uh, was a good deacon. 
he was a good elder. And he could not stand, or he could stand up to the rejection and the condemnation of religious leaders, even to his own death by stoning. Acts chapter 7, you read his story. Let me read a couple of verses. Verse 54. And when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And of course, we know that after that, they were like, you're a blasphemer, we're going to kill you. And they stoned him to death. As he was looking up to heaven, he saw his eyes were open. It was spiritual blindness that condemned him, but it was spiritual illumination that gave him the faith and the confidence and the courage to stand there and take it until he died when the last stone hit him in the face. You see, sometimes what we need most is courage and confidence to do the will of God, even if it's not a feel-good thing. Sometimes it's, it, God may reveal something to you and it's not, going to be, it's not going to be a fun thing. God may say something to you like, I have a plan for you and guess what? It's, it's actually going to be tough on you. But it's going to be to my glory. Will you say yes? Or will you run from it? You see, spiritual confidence or illumination enabled Paul and Stephen and it enables you and me to see more, which gives us more confidence. He enables us to see more, which gives us more confidence. Sometimes we just need our eyes opened, not because we need to uh, you know, understand all that's going to happen before it happens, but because sometimes we won't take certain steps unless we have the courage to see the future through, eyes, through the eyes of God. Finally, number four. Illumination gives us spiritual direction. Romans 8.14 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. How many know that life is full of tough decisions? And the Holy Spirit is the one who knows which way to go. When you come to a fork in the road and you have a decision to make, you have a choice to make about certain things about your life, wouldn't it be great if there was a bright light that shone on one of the paths and said, this is the way, walk in it. Okay? Well, sometimes that's exactly what the Holy Spirit does. Philip the evangelist was led by the Spirit to go down and speak to this Ethiopian in the middle of the, the, middle of the desert. God used him there. And then he was sent down to Samaria to go down there. God led him. God directed him. Peter was praying and God spoke to him and said, Go to the house of Cornelius. It's a, it's, they're not Jews. They're Gentiles. And Jews were not supposed to even go into the home of the Gentiles. But yet he was led by the Spirit to do something there. Paul was ready to take the gospel after he had gone north with the gospel. He was ready to turn east and take the gospel to Asia. You know that, that if Paul would have had his way, if Paul would have done what he wanted to do on the inside, he would have taken the gospel to China and to, and to all that direction. That would have been the first and the most Christianized part of the world. But just before he was ready to do that, Paul had a dream, and there was a vision from a man from Macedonia in Greece. And he said, come over here and help us. Come over here. And so Paul knew at that moment that God was revealing to him, nope, I don't go east, I go west. And so as a result, Europe was Christianized instead of Asia. That was the plan of God. You see, there are things that you and I don't know that God knows. And we need his direction. We need his plan. We need his purpose. So what does he use then to illumine our spirits? Well, first of all, A, he gives us God's word. By the way, this Bible is, is one of the greatest gifts you could ever have received. This is the revealed word of God. 
This was supernaturally delivered and supernaturally preserved so that you and I could have it today. Don't take that lightly. Every time you open this book, you're reading supernaturally delivered truth. There is great power here. So when the Spirit illumines is when he takes that word and he applies it to you. And he said, that scripture is for you right now. Now, by the way, let me caution you. For some of those who are on the, who are on the left field side of, of illumination, okay? God will never lead you contrary to his word. Amen. People who say, I have received a new revelation from God. And it, and, it, and it contradicts the current scripture, you know right then and there they have not heard from God. All right? And so God does not give the, that kind of revelation, but rather he gives the kind of revelation that takes the word of God and said, God is going to apply this to your heart and to your life and to your situation right now. Letter B He leads us through circumstances, or he illuminates, illumines our life through circumstances. How I many know the scripture that says, all things work together for good to them who are called, all right, according to his purpose. And so we know that, that the scripture speaks to us, but we also know that circumstances can speak in your life. God uses your circumstances, good ones and bad. You know, the Bible's full of people being tested with trial, but there's also times when the Bible says, I'm going to test you with wealth. I'm going to test you with with blessing. And what are you going to do with that? How is that going to be something that guides you? And so we need to understand that sometimes God allows certain circumstances in our life because we need a detour. And so it it, it causes us to go in a certain direction that that God wants us to go in that we would have never thought about if this hadn't happened. I can give you many, many markers in my life, and you could probably give me a number in yours. Letter C, and this one's going to be a little interesting because you may not see this when it comes to spiritual truth, but I want you to get this, common sense. You say, what? That's, that's not the Holy Spirit. Oh, yeah, it is. In Acts 15, 28, when they were considering what to do about missionary outreach, this phrase has, has, has been an important phrase that I've heard many, many times from the Lord. The phrase in Acts 15, 28 says this, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. What is that? What does it mean when he says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us? That sounds a whole lot like common sense to me. You know, that there's sometimes when, you know, somebody's sitting there trying to make a decision about things and it's like, you know, should I do this? Have you ever seen that commercial <clears throat> about the horror movies? And you got this group of kids, and they're running around trying to get away from the, you know, from the axe murderer or chainsaw murderer. And they're like, you know, what do, what, why don't we go here? Why don't we go there? And the girl says, why don't we get in the running car? <laughs> why don't we just get in the running car? And they say, no, that's stupid. Let's go hide behind the chainsaws. <laughs> You ever see that commercial? Anybody? I, I, that? I laugh every time. I laugh, it's, even though I've seen it so many times, I still laugh at it. Because that's what I'm talking about. Sometimes it's like, no, no, don't go to the hide behind the chainsaws. Get in the running car right now. Come on, have some, have some, have some common sense. And so sometimes I think that common sense is not that common. And maybe we just need the Holy Spirit sense. Scratch out common and write Holy Spirit sense. Because we need that sometimes. All right. Letter D. This is going to be an an odd one for you too. And that is Satan is often a tool that God uses to guide us. And to illumine our lives. Paul wrote about a thorn in the flesh that he had. And he called it a messenger of Satan. What what am I saying there? I'm saying that sometimes God uses negative things, evil things, 
in your life as tools to guide and illumine the path he has for you. And so when something bad happens to you, let me tell you something, bad things happen to good people. And so when they do, ask the Lord what it means. Ask the Lord to show you, all right, Lord, why, I don't understand why you let this happen to me, but there's got to be a reason. And when you start searching for it, you will find it. And God will show you exactly what he's trying to, show, to teach you during that moment. And finally, the last piece that I believe God uses to illumine us is other people. People like Terry, Jessup, can speak a word into our lives. I got a feeling you're going to be thinking about getting in the water for a while now. And other people are often used by God to help us understand His will in our situation. Some of my most encouraging moments as a pastor are when people have come up to me to tell me that a message I gave them last week or last month or last year, which I haven't even remembered, somehow perfectly fit into their circumstances of life. And it was exactly the word they needed. It was exactly the guidance they needed. And they, and they give me a testimony of how God used that moment. Let me tell you something. That is humbling to me to know that God would speak through what I, some message of guidance through what I have preached. And it, t- it breaks my heart and it moves my heart to know that God can use those things. That's why I never step into this pulpit without pouring my heart out to God to say that what I say up here has a huge, can make a huge difference in people's lives. And so God will take these, these words and somehow use them to guide and minister to you as well. All right, bow your heads with me, please. I'm going to ask a very blunt question. 